Uh, hi, so today we will study uh, GLSL to perform some to implement shaders. Uh, we will learn this shading language, open GLSL shading language, language uh, GLSL. Uh, so I will begin with that. Uh, so here is the set of slides. Uh, we already covered OpenGL stuff in the previous week. Uh, and from here, I will pass to the shaders. But before that, uh, let's also go through some OpenGL examples uh, on my website to uh, remember the language. And then I will do the uh, GLSL, Graphics Library Shading Language. So to that end, uh, we can look at the stuff on the course website here. So here you will find some OpenGL codes. Let's go through them to understand the logic and to see an actual complete program. We have seen similar complete programs in the PowerPoint as well, but anyway, so here, this is about to putting a cube on the screen, but using vertex arrays, an efficient version. Uh, I will be using GLUT for my Windows API. Uh, here are some basic uh, copy to be copy pasted uh, instructions. Then we will listen to keyboard input in this function. Actually, I will just use it for exiting, but anyway. Uh, and here I tell that my display function to be called uh, whenever some resize happens or some event comes is this function render scene. Uh, and this init scene will be called only once for the initializations. And then I will get into the loop to listen to the events and to see if I come back to that window. So, or if I resize that window. So this loop will listen to that. In the init scene, we set up the scene only for once. Uh, like in this case, it will be a cube with eight vertices. Uh, and I will be using perspective projections. So I will set my matrix mode to that uh, projection mode first. And I, uh, I will apply this transformation to my uh, camera transformation matrix. And then I will go to this different matrix, independent matrix that is about the moving object. It is called the model with transformations. So in that matrix, I will save some transformations later. So I am just, I just set it. I didn't do anything about it. Here, this is, um, so I create this list and inside of it, I put some instructions to draw a cube, which consists of uh, six, quad faces, here is one quad face, four vertex calls, make one quad, as you know. And again, state-based, I set the whole state, color state to this color, then do this vertex, then for this vertex, I will use a red color, etc. And this will complete the list for this cube. Uh, and when it comes to draw it, so, uh, to the screen, uh, I will use this vertex array trick actually. So normally I could put all these calls into my draw cube, uh, the drawer, the, uh, the drawer function, no problem with that. Uh, but the, uh, the, the real problem with that is I will be calling these functions every time when I want to draw something. And these functions get executed on the CPU, uh, which is not parallel, parallel friendly, as friendly as the GPU. So with vertex arrays, what I do is, uh, I will execute the, these instructions on GPU in a parallel manner, since I have a better, more oriented architecture, for parallel friendly architecture for that. To do that, I use the vertex array, uh, and yeah, so GL vertex array is defined. 
Uh, and when it comes to render the scene, I apply the model view transformations to move the cube around and then perform the drawing. Yeah, so again, the trick here is uh, these instructions, they don't go to CPU at every draw cycle. Uh, since I am using a vertex array, they get drawn in the GPU in a parallel manner because every vertex uh, is independent. So one vertex doesn't care about the position or color of the other vertex. So uh, I will reserve a different ALU for each of these calls in my GPU. And one further improvement to this is vertex buffer uh, VBO, buffer objects, VBO, vertex buffer objects. And in that case, uh, I sent this data to GPU only once in the beginning and then reuse it. Uh, so this model data. So in this version, those data is sent to GPU at every call, which is again, kind of inefficient. So we recommend VBO to even handle that. But for this example, only vertex arrays are in use. In the multiple cube version cubes, I will also show you some uh, animation. So this call, again, this, this is another callback function. So I register this function as the idle function. What idle function does is OpenGL continues to call this, calls this function. And inside this function, like let's go there, animate, I update some positions. P is for the height cube. There will be n many cubes on the screen. For the height cube, I update its uh, y value, like move it up, etc. Uh, and then I call the uh, display function, like go tell. OpenGL to go do the display in this display function. Here, I see that I register this function as my display function. So essentially, it goes to this render scene function in which uh, I do my background coloring. Then uh, I do some further movements, like rotate each cube. Uh, I could have used GL rotate F as well. 3F as well, but here I am explicitly creating my rotation matrix. And I also translate it further than for each cube. So this is also interesting. Uh, I define per cube, like uh, transformations that are specific to each cube. To do this kind of thing, I need to uh, use push matrix, pull matrix tactic. Because remember, there is only this one model view matrix that applies to everything on your screen. We are not using an open uh, object-oriented programming here, unfortunately. This is bad news about OpenGL. There is this state-based uh, architecture going on. And in that, there is only one matrix, but how can I apply it differently to different objects? Here comes push and pop to rescue. Um, so when you push matrix, Whatever you apply here, uh, it will be uh, re reserved. And now I call draw cube. So these two uh, transformations, when I go to my draw cube function, uh, I draw the cube using GL quads, using six quad faces. Uh, and this particular uh, movement, will be applied to the height cube. Then I pop matrix and for the next cube, I will be using a different translation because the, the p dot x of that will be different, etc. Uh, and now that transformation will be used for this same draw cube. But since the transformation is different, I will see this draw this new cube at a different location. So here the point of this cubes that see it is to introduce this push pop tactic actually uh, yeah so this is the heart of this code and other than that uh, so in this example we will be drawing a circle on the scene and here the scene in my init function here 
There is the init. Uh, okay. I will be using a 2D, two-dimensional image plane on this. So this will be a 2D app uh, that runs from this left, right to this top bottom. Uh, and yeah, once you set that up uh, during display, which is my display function, what I do is I uh, set the color and use the circle mid midpoint algorithm for the circle drawing. So we will see this in the rasterization class next week, but I assume that we have an algorithm to move around a circle uh, perimeter. So it in the circle midpoint algorithm, here is that algorithmic part. And then once it is done, it calls this function in which I put a pixel. I set this pixel to white. Okay, so th this function is new. Actually, this is implemented here. In OpenGL wise, what it does is it just use point, not a quad, not a triangle, just a point and 2D point using the current input. And the last example is about what uh, map it says, but so what can be new here? Uh, 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 so, uh, okay, so the new thing about this example is I divide my whole uh, viewport into two sections. In one section, I am applying perspective projection, okay, and then draw the world. And in the other section that starts from 400 and 400, and this is a smaller section of size 200. I do uh, an orthogon orthogon orthographic projection. In either case, I roll back to the model view matrix and do uh, a specific transformation. See, I don't need push and pop here because I load it to identity, do the translation here. I load the same matrix to identity. So like start from scratch and do the transformation. And in draw world, it is just a bunch of lines in colors like blue here. Uh, this draws only one line. This draws a second line, a third line. So you could have used only one GL begin lines and do these pairs of GL vertex calls in that block by resetting the color at the beginning of each pair of vertex 3F call. But this is also OK. Then some quad is drawn, and yeah, it's actually a second quad is drawn, and it goes like that. Okay, so this is the uh, idea of OpenGL, a state-based programming environment. Uh, that is the de facto in computer graphics. Uh, so there are extensions of this library, obviously. So personally, I use Open Inventor, which is the object-oriented version of this. It doesn't deal with these all state changes using push pop matrix tricks uh, but still this is more portable uh, it can run anywhere so OpenGL is uh, a good way to go and you are starting graphics uh, programming and now let's add further capabilities to our uh, rendering pipeline and here i will be using a shader Okay, so what is a shader? Shader is uh, a programmable uh, entity in GPU. It can be vertex shader and fragment shader. But let's start from scratch. So in the very beginning, you have this CPU application uh, saved as CPP or JavaScript in your uh, hard disk. And when you start it, th that program becomes a process. It is in your memory now. And you throw that uh, program to the memory of the GPU. So GPU from now on will talk with its own memory, which is good for efficiency. So here in the GPU memory, you send the uh, scene data or whatever you are going to draw, uh, which I represent here as triangles. Uh, and by the way, this picture is taken from Gemmuxels. PowerPoint, uh, 
as I mentioned in the previous week and I first discussed this, so this is the uh, uh, continuation of the same PowerPoint here. Anyway, uh, so the triangles here, they come in uh, and my CP application has this graphics API that knows how to talk with your GPU, okay? This would be your OpenGL basically. And OpenGL, through OpenGL, I will send my vertex shader program and fragment shader program to the GPU. And inside GPU, they will be compiled. So NVIDIA, AMD, they, those drivers are, they know how to compile this GLSL code or other shading language code. So, and they, have an optimized compilation. So they will have a nice fast executable here. And in the vertex shader, you essentially move the vertices around. Okay, so it operates on vertex level. Then using the transformed vertices, so you have all the 3D scene here. So vertex shader moves them all the way down to your 2D viewport using the uh, camera transformation and then perspective or, or projection transformations canonical view volume projection uh, we have seen before. And once you are in 2D now, there is this rasterizer that is not programmable. This is fixed, you can't manipulate here. And actually there is nothing to manipulate there. There are very stable, well-known algorithms that fills in, that decides the pixels that are inside these transformed vertices and their corresponding triangles or however you connect it, but in the end, they will be reduced down to triangles. So you will have triangle and you fill it in. So now you have pixels, your fragments. Pixel is equal to a fragment. Each pixel calls this shader, okay? So this operates on pixel level, whereas this operates on vertex level, vertex shader. We sometimes call fragment shader a pixel shader because it operates on pixel level. So at every pixel you have, uh, it calculates some colors most commonly, and then that will be your output. So this is the pipeline and shaders uh, will uh, do the transformations as well as the coloring. Transformations with the vertex shader operating on per vertex level, then uh, coloring operating on pixel level in fragment shaders. Okay, so this is efficient uh, so because in GPU, we have this parallel architecture, I think. Okay, so here is the uh, simple architecture of a GPU. So compare it to the CPU. They both have their own memory, which is I think to brag about, uh, but here you will see ALU, arithmetic logic unit. This is only a small amount because of the, uh, other components here, but GPU is more relaxed. It has it doesn't have that much responsibility. So we will put in a lot of ALUs here. So, and they will just be reserved for a given vertex like or a set of vertices, but they, there will be a lot of ALUs. So they will physically uh, operate on a lot of uh, vertices in parallel. So with that, so why do I need to operate on vertices in parallel? Because vertices uh, will be having independent tasks. Uh, the movement of a vertex is really independent of the movement of the others. Uh, similarly, uh, pixels will come here in the fragment shader. Uh, of course, there is no ALU for each pixel, but still there are more ALUs than I have in my CPU. So uh, a pixel will come here and again, it is independent. Uh, color of a pixel doesn't depend on the color of another pixel. That's why uh, we uh, are good to go here uh, to think about a uh, parallel architecture, which is uh, all GPUs are about. We call them SIMD architecture, single instruction, multiple data. So like the same instruction, like divide by two will be applied to multiple data and they are all independent. 
of course in graphics world the instruction will be like transform that will be a matrix and the same matrix same transformation uh, or it can be even different transformation per vertex but in the end uh, this action will not uh, kink uh, the output of the other vertex uh, yeah so as you can see especially in the first row we are uh, observing a, a significant in, increase in the course uh, on the ALU level. Okay, now let's see uh, OpenGL perspective, how you render stuff using OpenGL. With OpenGL, you have access to three vertices of a triangle in your triangle mesh. And then uh, OpenGL, uh, you have the base color and OpenGL uses uh, the lights and their directions and the, your, your current normal. Uh, OpenGL calculates them, those vectors, and then based on them, they put a portion of your base color to that vertex. Okay, so essentially they compute per vertex intensity. That will be the color. Uh, and then given three colors at three vertices of a triangle, what you can do is you can do flat shading using GL shade mode, GL flat. It selects one of those colors and repeats it at all the inside pixels, which would give you this result. Here, I think we have a quad mesh, so uh, but, uh, it looks like quads, but there may be also uh, triangles here, but nevertheless, uh, even if they are quads, open here, will do the same interpolation and get the per vertex color for four vertices and then do your flat shading. A better tactic can be Gora shading in which uh, you have three colors and you interpolate them inside the triangle using this tactic actually. So you have green, uh, red, orange, yellow. You first, uh, so to compute the color at this pixel, what it does in the background is uh, you make some interpolation between red and orange uh, at this level, uh, and then another interpolation at this level, then you make interpolation between these interpolated colors. So we call this bilinear interpolation. Uh, so Gora shading is an improvement, but you cannot uh, capture highlights with Gora shading because hi highlight is like here, you can see this is the highlight. For highlight calculation, uh, so the beginning and the end may not be uh, receiving uh, the light uh, as much as the center point here. So it, let's assume in the worst case, uh, due to the orientations here, you have zero values here, then you cannot uh, interpolate it to a non-zero value somewhere in between. So you have to have different values, which are not, which is not the case always. So that's why interpolating the colors on the vertices with Gora shading is not enough. That would give you this top output. Uh, with Fong shading, what you do is, this is not supported by OpenGL, but still the algorithm is, you have normals at these three vertices. And just like you interpolate colors, you interpolate normals, which give you this new normal here. And then using this normal, you can perform your uh, specular light plus diffusion light uh, color shading model and compute this color from scratch instead of interpolating it as in the Gora case. So with Funk, you will have a better output due to the specular components. So you have highlights now. And by the way, a different way to do this is using ray tracing as we have seen in the very beginning of our class, uh, of our course here, graphics course. Uh, but, uh, that will be a backward pipeline because you are sending rays from your eye towards the scene. It is backwards uh, and it is more importantly, it is slower. 
not as fast as this uh, forward pipeline based on projections. So uh, you can do, thanks to the shaders that we will see later today, you can now do funk shading as well in the forward line pipeline because thanks to the fragment shaders, I now have access to each pixels and I now can program them. Before, OpenGL was doing all my programming and in OpenGL they implemented this Gora shading so they uh, access all the pixels uh, but they don't give me any control. I am just supposed to use this all the time. They don't provide me the funk. Later on today, I will provide you the funk using the uh, fragment shader. Okay, so now let's see GLSL in action, the uh, graphics library shading language. Uh, it runs on CP, uh, GPU. So the general architecture is uh, your scene data in 3D coming to the vertex shader uh, in which it gets reduced to 2D all the way down to your 2D viewport. Uh, so this is responsible for the vertex-based transformations. Then in the 2D viewport, you rasterize your component. So you have, for instance, take a triangle. There are three vertices that make up the triangle. I only know the three vertex and their pixels. Now rasterizer gives me the other pixels that stay inside that triangle. You cannot program this unit. Uh, it is extremely fast. It is ready for you. And you cannot do better than that. So you don't have to program that filling part. Now the other programmable unit is the fragment shader. Here the rasterizer feeds in the pixels of that particular uh, primitive, like that triangle. And here each pixel computes its color. So this is about transformation, vertex level. This is about coloring, pixel level. And here is the tune shader which looks cool, or plastic shader. So uh, we will implement them. Actually. Let's implement this cartoon shader. Uh, and uh, with that, you will be seeing your GLSL code for the first time, maybe. Uh, and if not, no problem, obviously. But, uh, and also, these slides were prepared way before. Uh, that's why some of the functions here are deprecated like if transform, but the idea still stays the same. So the idea is the following. In the vertex shader, remember this is all about finding positions. What you can do is you can be lazy. You can just rely on the positions you, you compute using the current OpenGL model view matrix. So move your object around, rotate it, scale it and then project it to your viewport based on all your current OpenGL settings, uh, like GLU perspective or GLU ortho uh, that you have set during your init scene call in OpenGL. So here, actually, I do nothing special. I just use the exact positions uh, that OpenGL would have used. So I overwrite the positions, but I use the same positions. So actually, it is not a real over writing here. So the last line here is the most intuitive line. Given the vertex position, you transform it using model wave transformations, then you project it. Or to say one multiplication, you can use this multiplied version of these two matrices in this one uh, variable and apply it. Or you can just call a function in which they do this anyway. So uh, now vertex shader, uh, there is also the normal information. Again, remember each vertex calls here and each vertex has a position as well as uh, a normal, GL vertex and GL normal and GL position. Uh, so this normal along with the light direction, it gives you your intensity, right? Uh, the, 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 diffuse components. Uh, so the reason I compute this here is, uh, it will be clear later. Uh, uh, so rasterizer 
will interpolate this intensity value. So I have now three intensity values at three different vertices. And the rasterizer for that triangle will interpolate these values and give it here. So each pixel within that triangle calls here. And the intensity is a varying, it varies per pixel. It is not the same uh, for all pixels. That's why it is varying. So that intensity value, thanks to the rasterizer, it gets interpolated. So the three intensity values in my three triangle vertices, uh, for a middle pixel, there will be a new intensity. That is the interpolation of those three vertex values, etc. So if that intensity is uh, something like, then you will use this as your fragment color. So this is the simplicity of cartoon shading. You see only one color, as you can see. There is no variation, so it's also cool in some sense. Uh, yeah, so here again, varying is that variable. Uh, it will be, uh, uh, it will not be same for each vertex. It will vary uh, among vertices. Uh, so, and here, the interpolated versions will come here for each pixel uh, bounded by those three vertices. And uniform is like, it is same for each vertex here. What is uniform? The light direction because there is this light and it is just pointing to some particular direction. It is not vertex dependent. So we call it uniform then. Uh, and light direction is important because this intensity, by the way, the crucial line here is computed using our diffuse components. Let, let me make a quick pit stop here uh, in our... Uh, uh, so let, let's remember those uh stuff actually uh, so how to compete those colors etc so in the uh, youtube we put these uh, stuff in the computer graphics uh, plus and i think it would be in the ray tracing part two to that direction for simplicity. So the same is amount the of okay. I think is not I am close. Diffused. Huh, okay, this is the thing. So remember, you have some base color, uh, and you will have some diffusion diffusion reflection coefficient. So you will reflect some of that base color, but that coefficient is also scaled by this current orientation of you of your point normal as well as the light direction. So if light is uh, parallel with this, like hitting it hard, like it aligns with this perfectly, then this angle will be zero. So you will get the most effect. You will get all your diffusion. So you will get all the color uh, because that product would be giving you uh, one then. Remember that product and that L is the projection of this vector on this vector and the length it will be one if the angle is zero so this is the this is that uh, uh, diffusion color now coming back to our code here you will now see that similarity so that light direction is this light there? Uh, it is uh, again coming from your open clear. Uh, and your normal is per vertex. Again, each vertex calls here. So you have some normal. And the dot product between them, it will be a value between 0 and 1. So it will uh, define your intensity. Uh, so, uh, and then this intensity value, the, gets interpolated by the frag rasterizer and all the pixels inside those three vertices will decide on their final color value. And I then set GL frag color to that color. I can make a little bit improvement to the tune shader. 
so the result is here. So what I do here is, it is also a good track practice to understand what is going on. So I will tell, first of all, I will not update the positions. So I will use the exact clear vertex positions that I would have used with open clear. So I don't do any transformations. So this line is mandatory, but it is not doing anything actually. And this, I get the normal into this normal varying variable. So it tells rasterizer to interpolate this normal through the pixels inside those three vertices for that triangle. Now I have the uh, normal here and this normal, so I am, I now have a better normal because it is interpolated. Before I use a color and I give the interpolated color here. So again, remember the problem with that, if the colors are zero, zero, their interpolation will still be zero because you are not using any normal information. So this is, that's why not very good. But this version is the perfect version because I compute the color here for the pixel explicitly using the interpolated normal. Okay, so please understand that difference. Here, I compute the intensity for vertices and rasterizer interpolates it and gives a final intensity here. So it it doesn't have a it 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 will use that interpolated intensity. Here, however, fragment shader computes the intensity explicitly using the interpolated normal coming from the vertex shader and from the rasterizer. Yeah, so this is important uh, and that point should be clear. It also clarifies this varying variable. Uh, and actually, this is already a good GLSL example, but now let's put things together. So vertex shader, it gets per vertex information like position or color uh, and some other information and uses them. And in the end, it uh, computes a new position and sends it to the rasterizer. Or it can also send a color value like the intensity stuff we have seen here. Okay, so whatever you sent as output here will be interpolated and coming into the fragment shader. So those colors or uh, uh, the, the pixels, so all the pixels will uh, call here using uh, uh, the interpolated colors, uh, yeah, and in the end, you can play with those colors. Uh, you can create a new color, uh, and essentially, uh, you are computing the color or depth in some cases of a pixel. Yeah. So as repeated frequently, vertex shader is operating on ver per vertex basis. And it is responsible for the movement transformation of the vertex. Uh, so it moves from the 3D scene all the way down to the 2D viewport uh, inside this vertex shader. Then comes the fragment shader, which operates on per pixel level. Uh, given a primitive like a triangle, it has its three vertices defined by OpenGL and uh, after vertex shader moves them to 2D, rasterizer uh, decides on the inside pixels covered by those three vertices. And all these pixels corresponding to your three vertices as well as to your inside uh, pixels, they come into the fragment shader. And inside there, I compute a color for that pixel. So uh, that color uh, and Let's see an example about that before going further with the installation. So uh, that color can be what? Okay, so let's implement diffuse shading, okay, using this logic. So in the vertex shader, I get uh, the position through GL vertex, the current position that OpenGL would have used. And I use the same model view projection matrix to project all the way down to 2D. So essentially, I don't 
really kindly position, but I have to put this because I am overwriting the uh, functionality of OpenGL in this render program. Uh, and also I find the normal transform it. Remember normals need a different transformation. Uh, then I also have this uh, light direction. So now every vertex does this, learns its position and other features. These other features are varying. It means that rasterizer will uh, use these features, send them uh, here, but not just for these three vertices, but also for the uh, inside pixels that are bounded by those three vertices and the triangle they make. Okay, so then in the fragment shader, all these uh, calls, like you call here maybe 27 times, if it's, there are 27 pixels for that triangle with those three vertices. So for each triangle, uh, we compute, we have this diffuse color, like the color of the object, object specific. Uh, and now I will get a part of this color depending on this cosine term. So the angle between the your norm your normal and the light vector, if it is if the angle is zero, then you get all the contribution. If it is perpendicular, then you get zero contribution. And if it is negative, you just clamp it to a positive value because like to zero actually, because you don't want negative term here. Yeah, so and then you tell that okay, use this much of my diffusion color. And this much is decided by the uh, current normal of that pixel, interpolated normal of that pixel, as well as uh, the light direction. And to put things together here, uh, we can, uh, uh, we can see that, uh, thing here actually this is that diffusion uh, component so you have your normal at that point x and whatever this pixel is currently fragment shader is dealing with that pixel uh, it has a normal that comes to it after the rasterization the rasterizer interpolates and gives you the good normal and it also gives you the good light direction based on your location and the light location now you apply that dot product here and dot L gets some contribution of that diffuse color. Yeah. So that is what just happened over there. Uh, and coming back to our GLSL, uh, in, in this example, I am showing you how to change the position actually. So, so far I have just used the uh, model view projection matrix to the positions and that's it here. I am using a different position. So I am essentially moving the object down in Y direction. So velocity will be non-zero in Y direction plus some gravity force. Uh, yeah, so I compute a new position based on my current GL vertex position and I use that to get my new position. So essentially vertex shader here moves the object. Uh, here, again, I don't touch the vertex positions. I just use them as is. Uh, I, however, this shader is weird, but it does something. It gets the vertex coordinate X, Y, Z. And again, since this is varying, it gets interpolated. Uh, and in your fragment shader per pixel, the interpolated uh, VC coordinate comes. And based on that coordinate, I decide a, a value. Okay, so here it is. And I could have colored this model based on the normal values, not the coordinate values, but normal values. Then all you have to do is to replace this GL vertex with uh, GL normal. Then that's it. And here, once I started the diffusion shading, if I recall correctly, I also had a funk shader here. Uh, so 
uh, or not, let's see. Huh, okay, funk shading. So in the beginning, I told you that you can implement funk shading in the forward rendering pipeline using uh, shaders, which is a good news because it comes to, makes you come closer to the uh, ray tracing output with which you can do funk shading. But so far in the forward pipeline, not the backward pipeline of ray tracing, but in the forward pipeline of projections and rasterization, I couldn't do funk shading so far, but now I am putting an end to that suffering and I will implement a funk shading in the forward rendering pipeline. That's very fast. So what I need to do is first maybe uh, here, this is, I think, kind of fixed now. I don't change the positions. I just use them as is. Again, this function might be deprecated. So you can just uh, use your projection matrices explicitly. And here I compute, uh, so for the funk shading, I need a vector to the light direct direction. I need my normal vector as well as I need a vector to the camera, the view vector, right? For the specular, for the highlights. So maybe it is a good idea to first remember the funk shading first. So then I need to go back to the uh, previous lecture as well. At some point, I think I talked about funk shading. Okay, it is here actually, right? Okay, so this is the diffusion component we have implemented. There's also some ambient light, just fixed, very easy. But this specular, so you have some specular light, you have a light and it will, spe uh, it will be reflected. So this is the light's color, not the object space color. So how much of the light color will be reflected back to you? So if you are, where are you? So if this is the camera, this is the eye, so you are here. Uh, so we have to, look at the angle between actually at first i was using uh, okay i uh, and so if light is coming here it will reflect in this direction so i think i have a uh, okay yes this is what i'm looking for so light will reflect so if your eye is here then it will hit to your eye perfectly. So it will hurt your eye essentially because you will get all of the reflection. So how to get that? You will look at the angle between your eye vector, the view vector and the reflection vector, okay? Uh, or alternatively, a simpler way uh, to do this is, uh, it doesn't give the exact result, but I can use this half vector which is this, okay, so half vector is the half vector between view vector and the light vector, and you just take the half of it. Then you will look at the angle between half and n. If it is zero, like you are rotating it towards in, in clockwise. So this camera will like rotate in clockwise and it will, your eye will get uh, the light's reflection, right? So you can look at this angle as well. But what, whatever version you use, in the end, if you look at this formula, out of the specular component, the light's power, you will get some portion of it. And that portion depends on the uh, angle between your normal vector and this half vector, okay? Now, with that knowledge, let's come back to our GLSL code here. So I need uh, that view vector for that. I don't have to go all the way down to the view port. So I will just do the model view projection. Remember in the uh, previous cases somewhere here, I think in the fusion light discussion, uh, I have used uh, yeah, model view projection matrix. I also have done the projection. Now I don't want to go to 2D. I want to stay in the camera space. 
so that will be my view vector. So with that view vector, now, okay. So this is your vector to the camera and you also have a normal. So again, this is called per vertex. Now the rasterizer will interpolate this normal as well as this view direction and give, gives you the interpolated normal and interpolated view direction. Here, uh, you take the, that half vector, find it, uh, and uh, use it in your specular component. Yes, exactly here, specular reflection. So you add, uh, based on your normal and that half vector, right? So you find uh, that uh, weight, uh, how much of the light will be reflected, you decide on that, and here, uh, there is also this power, as you recall, about the narrow about the area of the speculation. So we take some exponent, and with that I use the light color. So it will add something to my color. Specular. In addition to specular, I already have the diffuse and ambient, which is repeated here. So for the diffuse reflection. Uh, in this fragment shader, all you need to do is look at the, your normal and light direction. There is no I vector, there is no V vector involved here. Yeah, and that will give you the diffuse vector and ambient vector is just, it doesn't depend on any normal, any other vector. So it is just plain simple. So you put all these here and set it to your frag color. And that gives you this perfect funk shading. Yes, now let me also finally talk about how to do this from your OpenGL. So how to connect your OpenGL and this GLSL, which is described here. Uh, so OpenGL uh, is, uh, it's a C-like language, okay. But I want to show how to send OpenGL programs to GPU because they get compiled in the GPU in NVIDIA or AMD or other and their driver, uh, their compilers and they create optimal uh, executables for us. And to do that, this is my OpenGL program. Okay, in my CPU memory, I have this. I call set shader. Inside, I create two shaders, vertex shader and fragment shader. And I read the code for vertex shader from a file using this, or you can, if you don't like to keep other files, you can just copy paste all your code between these brackets. Uh, yeah, so it will look very ugly, but whatever. Uh, anyway, now that you have your shader codes, you tell it here, and then, you compile those codes. So here they go to the GPU and you issue GPU to compile them. If they compile successfully, they, the results are written to VNF via call by reference. And now you create your program and you attach that compiled vertex shader to your program and that compiled vertex fragment shader to that program. Uh, and you link your program and use your program. So these are just fixed API calls. So here, the important thing is to fill in these two uh, shaders. And in this class, we have seen like at least six examples. So uh, I hope that it is clear. Uh, and to make you more comfortable with this, I will uh, uh, make you work on this, actually work on the cartoon shader, okay, in your homework. For the GPU part, I will ask you to um, render your transformed scene in via Toon Shader. Uh, nothing to worry about. We have discussed that already uh, here, actually. Uh, in the, I lost the slides, but it's somewhere here. I think it was the first shader I have introduced. So yeah, you will essentially use this as described in the beginning of the class. So it will give this kind of output to you. 
it will be more impressive. Uh, and yeah, that is all I have to say about the shaders. And in particular, we covered GLSL today. Uh, okay, so see you next week then.